Hello, Kiara. Okay, now I want you to find your place in the book. I'm going to read chapter four, and you follow along, okay? And I'll ask you questions every now and then. All right, here we go. Page 39. I'm in line for the spring award ceremony right between Wolfgang Gimes and Kristen Rogers. Kristen is in front of me. I focus on the back of her head, her naturally curly, soft brown hair cascading down to the middle of her back. Kristen's mom, retired stripper, Crystal Rogers, offers free pole dancing classes on Sunday afternoons if you bring your church bulletin. Of course, you have to wear clothes, and she dances only to Christian music. I glance back at Wolfgang. He shifts from one foot to the other, staring over the top of my head like he doesn't see me. Right. He can't believe he has to sit by you. He's going to be telling his football buddies about this at practice today. Now, Kiara, what is happening right now is that Ever is at an award ceremony for a... Uh, for a story she wrote, and this boy is sitting next to her, Wolfgang, and because Ever is a heavy person, she's kind of taking up more than just her seat, okay? And she's embarrassed. Hold up. <coughs> okay. I can't really, really blame him. It's pretty obvious I'm not going to sit. They put the wooden folding chairs lined up right next to one another, touching. There won't be room. Kristen is normal high school girl size, probably doesn't weigh more than 125 pounds. I can use some of her space. Wolfgang won't be as easy, though. He's big. The football player, camouflage hat wearing, take off from school the first day of hunting season type. His family currently supports a bill to allow legally blind hunters to use laser sights to hunt any game sighted people. Wait, to, to use laser sights to hunt any game sighted people can hunt. He was quoted in the Huntsville item as saying, This opens up the fun of hunting to additional people, and I think that's great. Come on, what's not to like? A bunch of blind people out in the forest shooting guns? What's the problem? Wolf, Wolfgang's going to need all of his seat space and more. Kristen glances back at me, flipping a few curls over her shoulder with a signature move and frown. Her light brown eyes are the same exact color as her hair. You've got to be kidding me. Out of all the kids in this line, I have to be next to her? I stick my tongue out at her, and she quickly turns back to face front with a huffy, puffy noise. There is a rustle of people and voices out beyond the curtain. The whole school will be here. It's required. The bleachers will be full of students all the way up to the nosebleed section. That means the highest section that there is. Um, the band will play, the principal will speak, some class president will say a few words, and they will announce the award. Are your hands shaking? It takes me a minute to realize Wolfgang is talking over my head to Kristen. What's wrong with you? I don't like being in front of crowds, she mumbles back to him. Stage fright. She should take one of her mom's classes. Remember, Kiara, her mom teaches pole dancing on Sundays to Christian music. Hanging upside down on a pole would probably give her plenty of confidence. I see Rat near the back of the line with the other science group. He gives me a silent thumbs up, and I nod back at him. Since I'm only receiving the award for outstanding sophomore English student, I don't actually have to go to the podium. That's the only reason I actually came to this thing. 
otherwise I would have faked being sick or something to get out of it. But they told me all I had to do was sit there and smile when my name was announced. They said I didn't even have to stand up. But I didn't think about I didn't think about the wooden chairs and tight little lines waiting out there in the stage lights. It was a stupid mistake. So Kiara Ever is being awarded the Outstanding Sophomore English Student Award. The only reason that she's going is because she doesn't have to stand up in front of everyone and give a speech. Remember, she's in sophomore year. Okay, she's in 10th grade. 16 years old and very heavy. But the problem now is that they have these very small chairs that she can't come, she can't fit into. And she's embarrassed. The boy sitting next to her is ignoring her and talking to the thin girl on her other side. Okay. But she's in the front row. Once when I was nine years old, I sang a solo. It was Christmas Eve and the church was lit only with candles. I sang, Oh, Holy Night. There was a collectively murmured, when I walked slowly to the center of the stage. They thought I was cute and chubby, and they were going to like it no matter what sound came out of my mouth because I was a kid and it was Christmas. Then I sang the first line. I could feel the surprise trickle through the crowd. I could actually sing pure, clear, perfect. On the first chorus, I hit the high note. Oh, my. And of course, she sang it. Beautiful, clear voice. My voice is lower, but still beautiful. I felt like an electrical plug needing a socket for the first time. The energy surged through me connecting me directly to every single person in every single view. I had them, all of them, held in a note, soaring through the wooden beams of the chapel. People wanted to look at me because they wanted to listen to me. My body dissolved into the sound. Kiara, she has a beautiful voice. Magical and totally addictive. I knew that night it was what I was meant to do. There was no one in the room who doubted it, especially not me. Then the music was trapped inside the crowd, and I stopped singing. Now I can only remember what it felt like to want people to watch me. I see Jackson in the front row of the trombone. Chad plays trombone. Remember, Jackson plays the trombone. Jackson is the boy she really likes. Jackson kissed her once once before, before her mom died and before ever gained all of the weight. I see Jackson in the front row of the trombone. He has on his football jersey, number 82. Not many boys play football and are in the band. That's part of his charm. He's a geeky jock. Perfect. I watch him laughing and talking with two flute players in front of him. He is so relaxed, so easy. His smile flashes off him, and the flute players respond with giggles. One girl, the one with the little red rectangle glasses, hugs him, still laughing. I wonder what it feels like to reach out unselfconsciously and touch randomly, casually, and frequently. You'll never know, Jimmy says softly. Never, ever. Kristen steps in front of me and sits down in an empty seat. I squeeze down into the space beside her, breathing in and out shallowly. It hurts to watch, but I can't stop. I focus on Jackson's face and try to feel smaller in the wooden folding chair. I cross my arms tightly over my chest and 
cross my thighs together. The less room I take up, the better. Hundreds and hundreds of eyes stare down at me from rows and rows of bleachers. Take a breath, another. Concentrate on being invisible and smaller. God, she takes up so much space. Just look at those thighs. I can't believe her fat is touching me. Kristen scoots to the far side of her chair, away from me, nervously twisting a strand of hair around and around her finger. I cross my arms even tighter over my chest and pinch my arms between my thumb and finger, harder. The pain helps me focus on something besides the eyes. The gym is as quiet as it's going to get. The principal, a middle-aged man with a forehead that stretches well over the top of his head, walks to the podium and taps the microphone a couple of times. After a few attempts at getting the top rows of students to stop talking, he introduces the junior class president. She is a black-haired girl wearing silver hooped earrings that swing back and forth as she marches up, the, up to the mic. Jimmy fills me in on what she thinks about me, which isn't much. Tracy places a couple of tight pages on the podium, and I see her hands shaking. She's practiced long and hard for this moment in the spotlight. When she starts to speak, I have to admit I'm surprised. Her voice, unlike her face, doesn't quiver. Principal Brown, members of the school board, teachers, parents, friends, and fellow classmates, it is an honor to speak to all of you today. Go Hornet! I slowly stretch my feet out in front of me, trying to make myself longer. It isn't working. Kristen makes a big, puffy noise. God, you are a cow, Skinny fills in her thoughts. I tune out a couple of sentences in Tracy's speech. I watch Jackson. Back when we were 10, we'd never seen snow before. So when the weatherman announced the possibility, it was like Christmas came early. It, there was a buzz everywhere. Grocery stores, sidewalks, libraries, and most of all, school. Everyone wanted to talk about the weather and the possibility of snow. When it actually happened, I was stunned. I opened my upstairs bedroom curtain to see everything coated in white. I hardly slept the night before, wishing for the possibility. My mom came in and told me the even better news. School had been canceled. I did a snow dance in my bedroom. It was perfect. I thought it couldn't be a more perfect day. I was wrong. Jackson knocked on the door around 10 that morning. I dug up every piece of winter clothes I could find and met him at the door with rubber rain boots and two gloves that didn't match. I had on two sweaters, a coat, a size too small, and three pairs of socks. I walked like a mummy rising from the bed. Jackson had a hooded sweatshirt on over several layers that made him look like a pillow top mattress. His eyes were bright with excitement when he clapped his red gloved hands together and stomped off his boots on my porch. The sun sparkled off the white piles of snow on the bare branches of the trees, making star-like shimmers of ice. The few orange leaves left on the tree limbs drooped down off of the brown sticks and surrender. Every once in a while, a big flop of snow fell out of the top, reminding us both that the melting had already started. We had to enjoy it fast. This is your opportunity to make a difference in the world. Blah, 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 Tracy groaned from the podium. The air was visible everywhere. Puffs from our mouths. From cars, from the tops of houses. Little white clouds of excitement. The cold made our cheeks pink, and I had to blink the dryness out of my eyes. A flake landed like a frozen moment in time, on Jackson's thick, black lashes. He blinked, but it stayed stubbornly in place. I reached up to brush it off. My throat ached from breathing in the air, but I did it mine. I remember crunching down the sidewalk toward the soccer field, 
delighted with the double trail of boot prints left behind. No one had been there before us, not even a rabbit or a squirrel. It was a white stretch of untouched fun. We stomped out into the field, laughing and slip sliding on an icy undercoat of grass. Jackson scooped up a big pile of powder and plopped it down on my head. I squealed and rolled away, reaching for my revenge scoop to push down the back of his sweatshirt. The fight was on. I ducked behind a park bench and just missed the flying snowball that broke up into a five minutes of powder as it hit a tree trunk behind my head. I waggled my fingers beside my face and stuck my tongue out at him. You're going to get it now, he yelled. You couldn't hit the side of a barn, I yelled back. I ran and he chased me. Catching me by the soccer goal, he grabbed me around the waist and we rolled onto the field, lying on our backs, the cold seeping beneath our layers of clothes. We gasped for breath. I opened my mouth at the sky and stretched out my tongue. A perfectly aimed snowflake drifted down and landed on his outstretched tip. I glanced over at Jackson. He was watching me so intently, so strangely. He rolled over suddenly, heavy with all his layers of clothes on top of him, his hands outstretched to clasp mine in the snow. He looked down at me. How did it taste, he asked. I could hardly breathe, but it had nothing to do with the cold now. Wet, I said. The sun shining over the top of his head left a shimmer behind like a halo. I narrowed my eyes to see him better. His face was so close, his cheeks so red with the cold, his eyelashes wet and spiky. I wanted to push his hair out of his eyes, but he held my hands down into the snow on each side of my body, and I didn't want him to move. I didn't want to do anything to make him move. My nose is cold, I said, because I needed to say something. I thought he would laugh and roll off me. I thought that would be the end of him. Instead, he leaned in even closer, closer, and then he kissed the tip of my nose, very softly. I blinked up at him in amazement. He kissed me again, this time on the lips, soft at first, and then a little more urgent. Our cold lips melted together in a frozen moment of absolute perfection. Now I watched him across the crowded gymnasium, pulling at the ponytail of the blonde boot fighter who had been confronting it. The snow day was a long time ago, but I remember every detail, every day since. And I wonder, how could he have forgotten? As we move forward toward graduation and our lives become blah, 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 I'm vaguely aware Tracy is still speaking into the microphone. No morning. One minute I'm a million miles away and the snow covered field takes the place on my son and Jackson's looks on mine. The next minute I am sitting on top of a broken wooden chair in a crowded high school gym. My teeth snap together with the force of the fall, my head jerking upward. A collective gasp echoes through the rafters. Rows and rows of horrified eyes stare down at me. I'm no longer in a chair. I'm on the floor. I'm on the floor. I try to take it in. The sound of the crash echoes. The speech stops. The chatter stops. The world stops. All eyes focus on the fat girl sitting on top of the crushed remains of what was once a wooden chair. Kristen stares down at me from her seat with a horrified expression of absolute disbelief. By sitting beside me somehow, the ultimate humiliation has spread to her. Oh, my God. She whispered, mortified. I looked beyond her, up and up, to the rows of shocked eyes, 
Tracy stumbles over her speech, but somehow keeps going. I know she will never forgive me for spoiling her moment. A teacher jumps out from behind the curtain, leaning over me. Are you hurt? No, I say, struggling to my feet. I'm fine. Tracy keeps blowing at the microphone. Our lives will be forever changed by our high school experiences. You think? Another teacher pulls a chair out from somewhere. He puts it behind me, and I have no choice but to sit down, though I'm careful not to lean back. All I want to do is leave, run as fast as my fat little legs can carry me, behind the curtains and out of sight of all of the eyes, but I can't leave, so I sit there. My legs shake from the strain of trying to not put any weight on the chair. And I try to ignore Skinny's voice in my ear. I knew that would happen one day. Did you see that fat girl? I can't believe I just saw that. Wonder if anybody got that on video. Got to post it online. My eyes are full of tears, but I will not cry. I've already done enough to draw attention to myself, but there is one thing I can't stop myself from doing. I look at Jasper. He is staring at me now just like everyone else in the gym. He feels sorry for you. He thinks you're pitiful. I look away, down at the floor in front of me, feeling like I have a huge red target right over my heart. I look away. I feel Wolfgang shift restlessly in the chair beside me, and he glances over quickly. His look is intense. Every hunter knows you have to kill something when it is wounded. It's just a question of how deep the wound goes before it's put out of its misery, Skinny says softly in my ear. There's a point when he realizes the poor thing is so wounded, it can no longer be fixed. I bite my bottom lip until I taste the blood. I'm not at that point. I can be fixed. I clench my hands and the fists at my side. There is still something alive deep inside of me. I can feel it beating against my rib cage with iridescent shape of ruby and amethyst queen. The next time I'm on a stage and people are looking at me, it will be different. Jackson will look at me the way he looked at Gigi. I will be in the spotlight to sing for everyone and to hear only applause. Are you crazy? There are parts like this that that girl must do. Then I won't be back. The idea of talking back to Skinny is a problem. Something I've never done before. But it's a simple solution, really. Girl loves boy. Boy loves girl. Girl gets back. Boy leaves. Girl cuts her stomach up into a little bitty patch to get boy there. You will die. Skinny makes the nightmare. I don't care. If I die, I die. I will do whatever it takes. I will let them cut my stomach open and change my internal organs forever. Even if I have to have a stomach and the end for the rest of my life, I will never feel this way again. I focus my whole being on trying not to cry. I don't hear the speech at the microphone or the applause that comes from the crowd. I don't hear the principal calling out the name for the award. I only hear one sound in my ear. I've never heard it before but it bounces off the inside of my brain and pounds against my ear. It's skinny, and she's laughing, and laughing, and laughing. Here that at the end of chapter four. I will read chapter five again later. And
ਦੇ ਨਾਲ